Thank you so much for listening. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email us at pa2cpodcast1 at gmail.com. Welcome and thank you to our listeners. Really appreciate you joining us. And we have a fantastic guest with us today, Sullivan Green. A little bit about your background. From Indiana, I went to college at Vanderbilt. After um, I got out of Vanderbilt, I went to the Marine Corps. I was in a uh, training and I uh, was in a jet crash where I broke my back. Got, uh, that led me to some bad places. I was in the hospital for a few years. Got out kind of had to help myself out where it come, came to the physical and mental stuff. Shortly published a magazine when I was disability discharge out of the Marine Corps out in San Francisco. Got into, from that, the magazine got into advertising and marketing. While I was doing that, about 20 years ago or so, I started speaking about PTSD and suicide and things that I dealt with because of the Marines. Um, and then about that time, I started getting asked to do talks for the military, which led to doing training for the military. And then uh, a lot of the same topics that they had me speak on, which was the mental health and leadership stuff. A lot of the men and women I met doing that got out, got into law enforcement. They started getting a hold of me and saying, hey, I'm seeing the same things here in law enforcement that I saw when I was in the military. Can you come talk to my department, to my friends? And I did. And uh, that was probably 17, 18 years ago. And then in doing that, um, I actually got involved with PATC at some point after that in a sheriff that I knew and did some talks for. And he was friends with PATC. And he said, hey, you should come over there and work with them too. So that's the quick and dirty of my background. What classes do you teach for PATC? Uh, we do uh, leadership for troubling times. We do a uh, peer support class, a mental health class responding to veterans and law enforcement. And really all of them kind of deal with the mental health issue in law enforcement and you're coming at it from different angles, whether it's as a leader, you know, what do you do to help your team be more resilient and respond to mental health better? Um, if you're an officer helping other officers, if you're an officer and you meet veterans in your community, you want to help peer teams, that, those sorts of things. But they're all kind of centered around that same topic. I would assume that in those classes, you hear some pretty uh, difficult stories from your attendees. Yeah, I, I think it's one thing that gives me, it's kind of, you know, can be hard, but I think it's good in doing this and that, you know, I've done this for so long and I've worked with so many different officers and so many different departments all over the country. You know, I think in some ways it's easier for people to s sort of talk to somebody that there's no threat to them. You know, you're away from your department. It's not your peers and you're worried about what they're thinking. It's not your department. And you're worried about what's going to happen to you. And it, 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 it's always pretty humbling how revealing men and women in the classes are willing to be. And, you know, to be honest, I probably learn way more from them than I teach them, to be honest. They're just some awesome men and women. Do many of your students suffer from PTSD? I think a lot of them do. I think a lot of them come there knowing they're struggling with stuff. And then I think as you go through the diagnosis, they do because you know, one of the things I try to share with them is, you know, PTSD isn't like a virus or a blood infection. I mean, it's just life. And, you know, if you take enough hits, it's going to impact you. And, you know, part of being in law enforcement is to do your job. You have to be in an incredibly highly emotional situation and in the moment kind of be numb to it so you can focus on doing your job. But then what that does, it, it tends to cause you to minimize the impact on yourself. It also, you know, long term, you're, you're, you're doing things, you're learning skills to numb your emotions that can carry over to home. And the result of it is they carry a lot around with them. And, the, and, and knowing there's something going on, but, they, but finding a hard way to face it. And then they get in the class and we start talking. And yes, it, you know, it comes up a lot. And I can't even tell you the number of officers who've gotten a hold of me after a class and then emailed me and said, hey, you know, I went to go see somebody and it really helped. And thank you. And that sort of thing. Would you say that we have a mental health crisis along law enforcement and fire officials? Oh, big time. And it's gotten worse the last two years, you know, because because basically the last two or three years, you already had what I would say is a mental health crisis. And then between all the different reasons in society with what COVID did, now you've got departments all over who are understaffed. Officers are overworked, um, especially, I think, in the sweet spot of what we do at PATC, you know, those departments, you know, who are sending officers to get training. You know, a lot of them, you know, your department of 50 or 60 and you're down three, four, five officers. All of a sudden, everybody's working over 
overtime. And that just makes the mental health even worse. Also makes it harder to get people help because, you know, if you're a chief um, someplace, you know, you're balancing two things. You know, the mental health of my officers is really important to me, uh, mandatory overtime. And that is a hard line to juggle. And that's one of the things, for instance, in the leadership classes that come up a lot. You know, how do I meet, you know, the mission of the job at the same time, created an atmosphere that cares for the officers and their families? Is that impacting retirements and people staying in the profession? Oh, yeah. People are getting out earlier. I mean, every class that I do, I mean, you'll hear a similar story. You know, half of our officers have five years or less. We've got sergeants with three years experience. Um, You know, we've got lieutenants who ordinarily would be sergeants right now. And and, and, and not only does it mean you got younger leadership who's less experienced, but it also means all those older leaders are gone and you don't have their example. And then something else I think doesn't get brought up enough. It's, you know, what are we doing for those officers that are retiring? You know, very few of any departments do anything to help an officer who's retiring unpack it. You know, most of them, 99% don't have the, hey, you're getting ready to retire. You've been a cop for 30 years. That's been your identity. You got a lot of stuff you're carrying with you. Now you get ready to go home, lose that identity. You're still carrying that stuff with you and your life's changed. You're not a young man anymore. Your kids have probably moved out of the house. Um, everything's going to change with your relationship with your spouse. What are you going to do about that? That doesn't get addressed. It's just, you know, on Friday you go to work and on Monday you're at home figuring out what you're going to do next sometimes. I remember you shared a story of an officer who had witnessed, uh, I think, a triple homicide. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that. Maybe you could share that with our audience. And what, what, do you, what do you remember in particular about the impact of it? I know a lot of officers that have had triple homicides. It was, I think that the officer came back to the office and nobody recognized what she had gone through. Oh yeah. Well, you, you know, I, let me, I'll give you a better example of the same thing. Um, th- this is pretty frank, but I, I think officers like frankness. Five times over the years doing this in five different places. So these people don't know each other, departments of different sizes. I think um, I've met five officers who came to a scene where a mother had cooked their infant, literally, whether it was a space eater or in an oven. And all five of those instances, they went to work the next day. None of them were taken aside and said, how did that impact you? Now, you know, you get the big mass casualty incident. You get in a shooting, someone's shooting at you. You get hurt in a car wreck. You're getting a lot of people checking in on you. You're going to get time off. But, you know, the day-to-day stuff, that's why, you know, there's this term in psychology, you know, cumulative PTSD, the cumulative impact. And see, it's things like that. It's the, you know, the double or triple homicide you walk into where it's already done. There's no danger. You're not being shot at. You know, it's, it's the mother who viciously abuse their child and then you just go to you just go home that night you know one minute you got a cooked baby in front of you that you're never going to forget the smell and the next minute you're at home with your wife and kids going hey i'm home and it didn't get addressed and then you know one thing you know to bring up people not noticing it you know everything's becoming electronic eyes now you know you know there i know departments that you know you don't even have briefings face to face in the morning before you go on your shift you know you, you you leave your house you go to your car you get on your computer you look at the notes from the shift before you look at what your sergeant sent you you go to work you patrol all day you come home you go in your driveway you do the same thing hit send and then you're home and no opportunity to unpack it nobody to go are you okay nothing like that are there model departments who in your view handle it well uh, I think Columbus PD does a good job. I think Indianapolis PD does a good job. Cincinnati PD does a good job. California Highway Patrol does a pretty good job. Those would be the main ones in my mind that come to mind. But, you know, I, I noticed over the last six months to a year, I've, I've met a lot more that when they say to me, they tell me what they're doing, you know, they're doing a good job. Like we just in the conference at your conference you just did in Las Vegas that I was at which by the way, I would highly recommend people going to. You want to get some good training and have fun? Go to the Vegas conferences that PATC puts on. But anyway, there was a guy in there and he had had me in a PATC class when he was at Brownsville, Texas, which is a big department, you know, right in the middle of everything going crazy in law enforcement now, you know, between staffing concerns and right there on the border in Texas. And I've got a mental health program that I have called The Ladder Up, and it's like this workbook. And he bought, he got like 40 copies of it, went back, did it with 40 officers in that department, and 14 of them then went and got help. Well, now when I saw him in Vegas, he moved from Brownsville to another department, a smaller department where he's the chief, and basically he is modeled all his mental health stuff around that. And, you know, as a chief in the class, 
talking to the rest of the class as, as you know, we're doing the training, you know, he basically says to him, you know, your number one priority is take care of your officers. And, and I think there's a lot of places that that is beginning to truly be their number one priority. And then that's really when you change things. And then I think the important thing to remember, it's why training is so important. You know, every department's different. Every size department's different. Your resources are different. There really isn't a one size fits all of this. You know, you, you know, you're a department of 60. You can't do what the IMPD is doing in Indianapolis. You can't, you can't do what the California High Patrol is doing. But what you could do is get a lot of training, understand mental health, understand peer support, understand leadership, figure out what's best for your department, and then make it happen. You know, make it where, hey, my number one priority is the mental health and the welfare and the families of these officers. And this is how we're going to implement it in our department. What do the good departments do? Uh, one, I think they do two things They they see their, when, when it comes to, this is going to sound really practical and simple, but I think the, the best departments do things like goal setting, where at the beginning of the year, sergeants have got to meet with their officers and you got to do two things. One, you got to ask, what are your professional goals for the year? And then two, what are your personal goals? Like, and you know, when, when you as a department make an officer feel like whether you want to get promoted or you want to stay where you're at, or you want to get out of debt, or you want to go back to school and get your master's, we've got your back. That immediately changes the atmosphere of the department. I think the second thing I'm seeing departments do that are healthy is making mental health checkups yearly normal. Um, these mental health things to develop over years. Usually we don't do anything till it impacts work, in which case it's had years to develop. Um, if you make it normal to get mandatory mental health checkups, it, it saves careers. People do not lose jobs because of it. It saves jobs. You know, you get help before it impacts work. You're going to keep your job. Um, you get help after it impacts work. You may or may not keep your job. And then I, I, I think the third thing that, you know, that good departments do, and I think should be a standard is, is making mental health training mandatory, like every other skill, you know, more police officers die by suicide every year than are killed by bad guys. So you take all the officers every year that a bad guy killed them. Okay. And I say that because line of duty deaths is a broad subject. You know, you could get the flu and die at work and it would be a line of duty death. But if you think a traditionally, what are threats to officers, someone shooting them, someone running them over than made in a car wreck. Every year, more officers kill themselves than die at the hands of another. And I think because of that, you know, just like things like use of force and different job skills, you know, mandatory, there's mandatory training for it. I think mental health training should be mandatory. Do they establish a relationship with mental health providers? They should. The good departments do. You know, sometimes it's, it's not even small ones, it's big ones. But I, I think good departments have mental health people on staff and then they encourage those mental health professionals to get to know the officers. Because if I know you and I have a relationship with you before something happens, I'm much more likely to talk. But it's kind of the same thing with chaplains. You know, there are chaplains who just wait for people to need them. And then there are other chaplains that go, hey, can I go ride with you tonight? And it's the chaplains that ride with an officer all night are the ones they come to. Well, to me, mental health professionals, it's should be the same way. Like they, they should see themselves as my job is to build a relationship with the officers of the department. And then when there's a problem, they're going to be much more likely to come to me and use me and trust me and be willing to let me help them. Uh, what are some of the leadership traits that you teach about in your leadership okay. class? Well, the number one is if you as a leader cannot be vulnerable in talking about how the career has impacted you, you are teaching your department or the men and women you lead to be mentally ill. You know, you as a leader have got to be willing to get in front of people and say, you know what? There was a time this job impacted my marriage. It impacted my mental health. It made me angry, whatever, you know, and it doesn't even have to be a big deal. But if you aren't vulnerable enough to do that, you're basically teaching your department to suck it up. And you could have the longest list of resources of any place in the country. But if the attitude is, man, I'm good, you should be good too, no one's going to use it. And you're going to, you are going to be the one contributing to the mental health issues they have. So number one, you got to be vulnerable. Okay. And then without, you know, going on too long of a list, I think one, you got to be vulnerable. And then two, in an age where we have an overload of information, when and you got departments that are overworked and understaffed. You got to set the example that you're willing to listen. You know, you, you got to take the time and you got to set the example that, you know, you're a chief and you got a captain come in your office, put the phone down, shut the door, turn the computer off, look him in the eye. And, you know, every once in a while, once you get through the issue, ask them how their family is. Um, ask them, you know, what are they doing this weekend? Ask them, hey, your, your retirement's coming up. What are you thinking? Because if you don't set that example, there's a pretty good chance they're not going to set the example. And to their, you know, lieutenants, 
lieutenants and the lieutenants aren't going to set the example to the sergeants. And then you're just going to have a disconnected staff that's not very empathetic to each other. So when you're not teaching, what kind of things do you like to do? Oh, I like to spend time with my kids. I coach basketball. I've been coaching basketball for about 12 years. I like to write. I like to travel, you know, just kind of Indiana things, you know, play basketball, spend time with the kids, go camping. And how many kids do you have? Got nine kids, all from the same woman. Incredible. No twins. That's fantastic. Absolutely incredible. What are the ages? Uh, oldest is 23. That's Isaac. And the youngest is six. That is Julius. Five boys, four girls. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Well, thank you so much for appearing on our podcast. We thoroughly enjoy our relationship with you. You're a fantastic instructor. To our audience, uh, watch for Silwan's classes. They're fantastic. They always get high mark. I appreciate you appearing on the PATC podcast. Hey, I appreciate you, Mark, and what you do at PATC, man. One.